Do you find it hard to explain to friends and family what you now do? Are you wasting valuable time by attempting to figure out challenges on your own? We have created a community for ex-corporate people running their own business who want to live a life they love whilst giving back to their community. This is the Build Live Give Show. We bring you first-hand experiences of guests going through many of the struggles you face each and every day. We get real with no corporate BS. And now your host, Paul Higgins. Welcome to the Build Live Give podcast, episode number three. Hi, I'm Paul Higgins and I'm your host. And today we've got a fantastic guest, a good friend of mine and someone that's made a real impact on my life, but also millions of other Australians. His name is Jeff Coombs and he is famous for being one of the co-founders of Tour to Cure. And Jeff goes into his story of how he started that from a barbecue chat to what it is now, a $30 million charity. And he's got great ambitions to turn that into a $60 million charity. So there's some great inspiration in what Jeff goes through. And he also provides some really good practical advice of how do you balance your own business, a family, and also giving to the community through uh, Tour to Cure. Uh, so um, have your pens ready, your notepads, or your digital, whatever you, you do. But there's some real gold in, in this uh, podcast. So um, what's been happening in Build Live Give community, the community is growing. We've got a free closed Facebook group for you ex-corporates that are building a great business, living a fantastic life and giving back to the community. So that continues to grow. And if you go to buildlivegive.com, you can get access to that Facebook group. And also there's been a lot of five-star reviews and please continue to uh, leave a review. It really helps grow the audience and the better we can uh, grow this, the, the, the better that we will all benefit from this. And also share the podcast with your friends as well. That would be fantastic. But as I said before, we've got a fantastic interview with a really great person and a good friend, Jeff Coombs. So get your pads and pens ready, and now over to the interview. Welcome, Jeff Coombs, owner of Tribe Design and co-founder of Tour to Cure to Build, Live, Give podcast. What we'd love to do, Jeff, is just start with a little bit about you, your journey. So, you know, where did you start and how have you got to where you are today? Uh, g'day, Paul. Lovely to, uh, lovely to be here. Gosh, where did I start? Um, if I go so far back as I was straight out of school, got into hospitality and, and had some five-star hospitality concierge and commissionaires in some of Sydney's best hotels. Uh, decided to study and, you know, a little bit aimless at that age, didn't know what I wanted to do and got pushed into civil engineering that I rightly didn't enjoy and certainly wasn't me. And But finished, finished a course and then decided to travel and that travel bug that most of us do was probably where since I've ended up as is probably the, the key thing that has taken me to where I am now. But I rode across America when I was 26 and had a couple of months before I needed to get to Whistler for a ski season. And that adventure of riding across the country by bike was pretty amazing. And so I then ended up in Whistler and worked the ski season as most Aussies have probably ever done. And Stayed on to be a, a mountain bike tour guide and a whitewater rafting tour guide in Whistler during the summer. So that adventurous side of being young and, and able to kind of take on anything in those days. And then came back from, from traveling with some, some serious debt and needed to get probably pretty sensible in what I had as a job and fell into marketing. Joined a, an agency called, um, oh, I can't even think of their name, Creative Field Marketing way back then and was the one of those Pepsi taste patrol dudes driving around the street and went through various roles within that organization to eventually become their state manager in their Melbourne office and kind of felt that was the only job I'd ever really had um, in business. So left to spread my wings and worked in category management in the liquor industry and point of sale design and then promotional marketing. So all the things that I guess in sales and marketing gave you a very rounded set of skills, um, which, I thoroughly enjoyed. You know, I, I'm definitely more of a marketer than I am a civil engineer. Excellent. Well, that's a wonderful journey. And just going back to that trip across the US, what what sparked that? What was the key driver to say, "Look, I'm going to ride across the US"? Uh, the mate that I rode with, um, a guy by the name of Nick Gassman, he and I used to kind of get 
daydreamed in in history and just talk about going off on adventures in he was all we were always talking about riding through the south of france just you know because you could and that he decided he was going to go across to the us and it was just the right time for me to to leave and go and do some things and we literally ended up in new york and the idea of riding across the country had had kind of surfaced back over a few drinks and um as you do with you know a credit card and and time on your hands you go into a bike shop and you come out with you know mountain bikes and panniers and some camping gear and a, a map saying go west and a train ticket to vermont and suddenly you're away so very much the the adventure of we can just do it let's go it was awesome uh, that that's that's great and it looks like we might have crossed paths you doing work for pepsi i was doing work for coke back in those <laughs> days so uh, we we're probably arch enemies uh, back then and uh you know a little bit about what you do uh, today just uh, i know you've sort of wear two two hats um just sort of talk to the yeah. community about what you do today yeah so have have a business called tribe uh, tribe culture and tribe design where we import lights and um, sell them into various lighting stores and some retail stores in australia um, starting to wind that down a little bit purely because the the passion and, and energy that i have for this other little thing that i started about 10 years ago is consuming so i'm the co-founder of the tour de cure we're a cycling charity that raises funds to help try and find a cure for cancer and started that 10 years ago with a couple of mates and it's gone on to to do some pretty big things and now we've got a uh, an extensive program and we have a number of events around the country and i'm still very much invested in in the the charity around trying to deliver an outcome that is an end to cancer yeah and look up you know i've been on a haven't been on a full ride but i know i was involved a couple of years ago and now i still wear my top from that day and i often get people thanking me or asking me questions or you know it's such a a buzz in a and an awesome community you've created and there's a couple of build live give community members out there that have done the ride as well so uh shout out to them paul fitzgerald and, and a couple of others so um yeah we got sure. fitzy we got fitzy back on a uh, an event with us next month in fact all at short uh -huh. notice coming in a, as a one of our leaders to help deliver a, a tour safely so yeah man, i love it we get to engage passionate people and and brands in our you know journey of trying to cure cancer and over the years, we've raised just shy of 28 million, uh, shared a cancer awareness message, helping kids to learn how to prevent cancer through a healthy lifestyle to about 85,000 kids and um, invested the money into some really amazing research projects of which 18 of them have, have actually had some scientific breakthroughs. So we're on the right track, long way to go, but love it, absolutely love it. Brilliant, and just sort of going back, I know you're you know working for someone else's you know sort of smaller business and then you decided to start your own and you know eventually went into you know combining both um what were sort of the key things that were, might have been holding you back at the time to to leave the security of a job and, and go uh, start your own company <laughs> it's a good question i'm trying to think back i think at the time um you know the tribe came after tour de cure and tribe kind of came out of a necessity to generate some income i think the i was working for a company called the promotions factory and i probably wasn't doing a very good job purely because my focus was around this passion that was tour de cure and in the first year so i was an account director for them actually looking after coke so our, our paths came back together at that point doing all the promotional merchandise for coke and and that was, that was it was good but it was also a job that i just i couldn't see the couldn't see myself doing and creating landfill in in some cases that were you know, coach show bags and hats and promotions to win and nothing against it but it just wasn't it wasn't me and when the opportunity to build this community around tour de cure started taking shape and we had some wonderful corporates get involved with us from the ground up and there they continue to be involved as we've grown and look to do more so what we needed to do to invest in getting them to continue with us and and our kind of securing our space in that new charity world meant that i couldn't do a full-time job so i fortunately didn't have any incumbents or any too many responsibilities in those days so i could choose to 
kind of forego um, a fairly good um, salary working for a promotional company and, and actually decide to go for it and try and see whether I could build this charity and, and get it to a point where I was uh, as invested as I am now. So over the years, I've grown to go from one day to now being full time with Tour de Cure. And in the earliest days, when I you know, needed to create some sort of income, Tribe became that way of doing it. So knowing the, the promotional merchandise world and Again, I've uh, you know not hard to sell those sorts of ideas and concepts, and, and knowing how China worked, it was it was fairly easy to create some revenue through that. And yeah, it was it was a nervous time because you didn't know, and you were you know, at the mercy of payment schedules and and trying to negotiate the best thing that you could do for your own small little businesses that started. But you know, it was exciting. I wouldn't I wouldn't go backwards. I think there was times when I probably didn't know how much money I had in the bank, but there's also times when, you know, getting, getting things up and running and seeing things come to life. That's probably the thing that I, I enjoy the most because over the years when you worked for someone, you really didn't have that identity. You didn't feel like you, you, know, you set yourself or created something that you could you know, happily have those conversations at dinner tables. And I, for me, I just felt like I was working for someone. It wasn't, it wasn't something that I could say I'd actually created and then try I still probably wouldn't say it's the, the piece that I would now be the most confident in talking about, but creating Tour de Cure and, and, and seeing that to where it is now, yeah, I'm filled with tremendous pride for what we've been able to achieve. Yeah, and look, you know, the, I suppose that's the journey that a lot of our listeners are going through, you know, the build, live, give, and I think, um, you know, I'm so excited to have you on. Um, a, we haven't spoken for a while, but B, just because you are a shining light in that area where you've really backed yourself and you're making a massive impact. And I'm sure when, you know, your kids are describing what dad does at school or to their friends or whatever, you know, you, you know, they must be so proud of what you've created and the positive impact you're having, which I'm sure that, you know, yes, selling uh, trinkets to Coke or Pepsi would have been okay, but I'm sure they wouldn't have had that passion and that fulfillment in their own heart. Um, telling that story to their friends may you spot on i mean the when when a number of our team say that their kids want to come and do the tour de cure with them you know that that just fills me up that's amazing and then all the other things that we get to go and do and i'm i'm fortunate in the space that i'm in you you're spending so much time with people that are in a giving environment they're they're at their best you know they are um, living values that they want to have in more of their life, but finding the tour de cure or any charity for that matter as a way of doing it. So yeah, it's a, it's a special thing to do. And the caliber of people that, that choose to become involved and, you know, mums to tradies to business executives and CEOs. And, you know, it's such a, a wide gamut of people, but they are, we're very lucky there. The people that have become involved with us are, you know, it's a pleasure to know them, let alone have them so invested in what we're doing. Yeah, look, that's a great point. And that was going to be one of my next questions was, you know, what help did you receive, um, especially in the early days? If you can just take me to, you know, some of your biggest challenges with um, launching Tour de Cure and, and what sort of help did you get? Yeah, look, I think it's it's one of those ones that at a, at a point now I would recommend to anyone trying to do anything is you don't have to know all the answers. There are so many people around you that – have had the answers or are willing to help and it's i think always being open to allowing other people to share their knowledge and you know, create those opportunities for you and from the very get-go with the tour de cure the we had a, a, a little powwow session with some mates and suddenly someone knew someone at kellogg's and lexus and optus and with before you know it you've got um, these meetings at a senior level and obviously some well-connected friends in those days but I think as you, the more you get to know people and, you know, it's, it's a, I wouldn't call myself a good networker, but I, I never forget where I know people from and therefore being able to remember, oh, okay, I, I caught up with you, I've got a, got a favor to ask or could you point me in the right direction? And I think always had that attitude of, of being able to confidently remember and then ask people if they might know or be able to help. And then we, we did, we had wonderful people and the co-founders that I started the Tour de Cure with, I think that certainly helped because having a, an idea for a bike ride is, is one thing, but unless you, you know, step away from the table and, and choose to get involved and you know, we all rolled our sleeves up and those founding members that came to our first meeting all 
did exactly what they said they were going to do. And most of us are still involved today. You know, we've, we've all kind of gone through this to, to 11 years later, be looking on this thing going, wow, it's, it's pretty incredible what we've created. Yeah, that's great. And um, I, I know, you know, you set this up for such a, a great cause, but, um, you know, how do you keep it running? How do you create the revenue to, to, to keep the business uh, going? Yeah, sure. We, um, so charity is highly competitive and, and I think there's 400 odd cancer charities in Australia and we're, we're probably now in a space according to the ATO where we're sitting in that kind of getting to the large end of the table, which is pretty interesting when we sit raising this year, we'll raise just over six and there are some of the big guys, are you know, 70 to 140 million and suddenly we're, class in that category which i find a little bit unfair but most of the the team that we most of our revenue would come through from the fundraising of our individuals so anyone who joins our events um, takes the opportunity to engage with their network in getting some support and i'm sure we've all had those emails where people ask you to support them because they're doing something big and audacious you know it's not shaving your head or growing your mo but the the big rides that we do and the physical um, efforts that need to go into that uh, are certainly something that in the early days I think were what people got behind and then over the years the fact that the funds are achieving some results we go and visit school kids and, and share our message with them so we're not just a, a cycling group that goes for a big bike ride and has you know closed door dinners with lots of red wine we're very much around how do we engage people and therefore the, the impact that that has and if that's getting communities to become more engaged and corporates to to stay engaged and drive their investment with us and engage more of their customers and their staff in participating in our events attending our dinners you know providing items that we can auction you know, we've got a number of corporate tours that we're doing for a few of the banks actually and you know, it's a great thing for them to engage their staff and their customers to get healthy, to go and give back into the community. We go and visit the schools of the staff members of the branches. So it's, it's very much a big circle around how we can connect. And through that, the corporates contribute um, probably about a quarter of our, our funds raised. And then our team, our passionate team that go out there and, and raise funds. We also do a little bit in retail land where um, Woolworths have helped us sell some high bounce balls, which the kids love and, and we love it because it gets the kids playing handball. And and those kind of the sale of those balls is, has been really well received. So those three different revenue streams, corporate, community fundraising, and then a little bit in retail. Excellent. I know in the preparation coming on to this podcast, you spoke about the fact that, you know, because it is growing so successfully, that in itself has become a, a bit of a opportunity for you that, uh, you know, how do you uh, manage that growth? You know, what are some of the biggest challenges that you faced as you've grown this so quickly? Um, gosh, uh, I'm sitting in a little, uh, you know, office looking out at the team and kind of having a quick moment thinking back to when it was sitting around my dining room table in a rented apartment in, uh, <laughs> in, in a house two decades ago or a decade ago. So how far we've come over those years with, you know, now having uh, still a small team, but, you know, we now have someone in finance, someone in marketing, com, someone in digital, you've got your events team, you've got someone that's, you know, just an office wizard. So it's those sort of hurdles have, you know, Initially, it was it was all us, and as much as you could ask for people to volunteer and donate of their time, I think now the, that we've got some revenue and we can try and invest in some of those smart resources to to deliver more and and hopefully manage more events that people can participate in. But you still got to be relevant. The the events have to be engaging and inspiring, and the corporates need to see the return on their investment. So it's evolved over the years from probably just being something that people felt they could, you know, I'll, I'll help you out. I'll get you off the ground. I'll, I'll give you something to, you know, now it's, it's a way for people to contribute quite significant amounts of their time and, and their funds and um, enrolling those people. I think, you know, in the charity sector, we don't pay big commercial rates. We don't pay for much if we can avoid it. Um, so always trying to, to keep your costs down and deliver as big a result as you can through the cause. And you'd want to, you know, you've got ambitious plans to kind of deliver on some things and, you know, capability and capacity sometimes just don't mix. They're not on the same page. 
And that's probably one of the hardest things when you can see how you can get to somewhere, but you know, constraints in, in certain times don't allow you to, to invest there. And subsequently you have to kind of step back a little bit and go grow at a slightly slower rate than you might think you could. Yeah. And, you know, with your growth, where do you look for inspiration? Where do you get your ideas on, you know, future, um, the future strategy for, for Tour de Cure? Yeah, we've got a very invested board and, and, you know, they're diverse and they're passionate and, and certainly smart and sincere in, in what we're all trying to achieve. And we set a, a clear vision for, for every three years and we review that regularly to make sure that we're on track with that. And, you know, we re revise it where we need to. So I think the the goal for us here is we sit just shy of 30 million. Our goal is to get to 60 million by 2020. We, we have an ambitious target of trying to get every child in Australia with a, with our cancer awareness message, you know, be fit, be healthy, be happy. And we're, we're 85,000 kids to date, but how do we get every child with that message by 2020? So we need to be smart in the way that we can engage people across different platforms and have involvement in curriculum and have a digital strategy. And so all those ambitious plans probably will keep me going. You know, it's, if we were just going for another bike ride and it was trying to route something that was slightly different to the last one, I think that would, you know, we wouldn't be current and we wouldn't remain consistent with what we're trying to achieve and therefore even be relevant to, to our team and to corporate. So we're always trying to see where we can do. And a good example would be last year um, with the, the help of one of our corporate partners, ComBank, they said they wanted to engage more people and would we take on a walk and would we kind of create this walk platform that finished on the same day as our ride and we could therefore have riders that go on a three-day adventure finishing at the same time as you know, almost triple the number of walkers doing a 25k walk and because it complemented our philosophy on you know being healthy and being active and fit then we're like terrific you know so we created the walk and that was tremendously successful and the the fundraising and the response from the team and the overall wellness that i think it created for everyone that got involved now has us sitting ready to try and create you know another ride and and three walks in three states which is very exciting and i think it's it will be an evolution for us to have more people throughout an organization and a greater spread of you know the sexes and ages who if they don't you know they're not keen road cyclists or they don't want to they can't get away for eight nine ten days then terrific we'd like to create something that got them thinking about the lifestyle choices to be healthier which in turn are going to help them prevent cancer amongst other things you know it will help them with their heart disease and weight management and all those other sorts of things great and look in a moment we're going to sort of peel back the layers a little and ask you a bit about how you manage to run your life doing you know this fantastic uh effort that you do but um you know there's a lot of blg listeners out here wanting to get to where you've got to and you know they want to create a movement like you have and uh, and positively impact people you know what's a piece of advice you'd give them based on hindsight given your journey what what's a bit of advice you would give them if they were to go down a similar path oh man i think it's don't don't delay you know life's too short you never know when your number might be up so if you've got that ambition and that desire inside you you know, start by writing it down, start by chatting to a few people and, and getting the ideas out of your head and, and into, you know, some sort of form where it takes shape and it can evolve and it doesn't have to be exactly as you'd, you know, might think now with the influence of others. You know, some people can't do it alone and others can't do it in partnership. So I'm, I'm one of the guys that likes having a lot of people around that kind of we mould and create things together and enjoy the, the process. Um, but I think, you know, time's right. Get out there, go and do it. You you won't regret it. You absolutely won't regret it. And you know, if you can achieve the success that you want, great. But I think in the process, you'll learn a lot and you'll come away better for the experience. And who knows? You've you'll probably you'll probably be successful. Yeah. Look, and you know, part of this, um, the reason for creating this podcast is to help people realise. And I love your point earlier, where you've just got to start. You know, you don't need to have all the answers. You've just got to start somewhere. And, you know, hopefully someone today listening to this podcast will take your advice and actually make a start that will have a really positive impact on the world. So, uh, 
you know, that's, that's, that's why we're here. So your typical week, you know, you're a really busy person. You've got two businesses. I know you're sort of scaling um, one down a little, but just take me through what a typical week looks like for you. That's if there is a typical week. Oh, mate. Yeah, there's nothing too typical about my life at the moment. I remember my wife married me and I was just starting this charity and, you know, we've, we've since had three beautiful kids and I've gone from having one event a year to probably nine and, and nine across the country that mean I'm traveling and getting things prepped around the, around the, the various states. So the, there isn't, a, I guess, a normal but I, I think a typical day for me, I, I get up really early. I go to bed stupidly early, but I get up at probably 3, 3.30 most mornings. And I need a couple of quiet hours to myself. And I typically get on get online and do some work or I might watch a show that I'd recorded, but I'll probably clear out some emails and just get some quiet time that I can just be around me because once the kids are up and when I'm in the office and I, I live very close to, to work, so I don't even have that downtime in a commute so for me those few hours in the morning whilst i many would say you're sacrificing sleep i go to bed at kind of 8 30 9 o'clock so i'm still getting getting as much sleep as i can and probably live on a little less than most anyway but coffee machine at home and and those quiet hours and they slip away pretty quickly when you're you're try, just trying to catch up a little bit on things and then i'll try and go for a ride and you know get some training in so i might leave at 4 30 to meet some mates at five um get a have a quick coffee and go for a spin with them and try to get home by quarter past six half past six my wife's a keen swimmer so we tag team and she goes down and does a, a swim down at the beach for kind of an hour and a half which is a good balance for her with the kids I'll then get the kids ready and, and get the lunches done and she'll come back and usually she's, she's freezing from the, from the water and she'll jump straight in the shower under which I'm kind of giving her a quick kiss and saying I'm off. So into the office and the day starts. So yeah, she's, it's been, I spent a lot of time on the phone, um, a lot of time connecting and, and trying to build the things that we're trying to get across and bring the partners along the, the journey and a few people in my team that, we're working on some some projects, you know, short term and long term. Um, as quickly as the day starts, it seems to finish, and I get home uh, five thirty, pretty much six o'clock, because I'm very close to work. You know, have dinner and, and enjoy some time with the kids, and you know, I'm often in bed sometimes before they are. So that's me. Right, <laughs> and um, you know, we talked about it before, but what's the impact? on you launching Tour to Cure, what impacts that had on your um, family? Um, look, they're, they're very supportive and, and I think incredibly proud of what we've done. And, you know, one of my best moments for the Tour to Cure was actually presenting at my kids' school and getting the kids up and, and helping me with the presentation and then the after effect of them being, you know, they're all, their, all their mates, you know, happy with what, we do and and we've stayed involved with getting the kids to you know do handball competitions and very engaged at that level i think that the travel that i have i try to minimize it as best i can and there are windows of time when we're on tour and my wife would probably think that i'm off having a jolly jolly nice bike ride but when you've got upwards of 150 people on a multi-day tour and all the logistics and planning and corporate engagement police um, you name it it's it's an intense job so from you know sun up to sundown you're on and and the responsibility sits with me on everyone getting home safely and and the tour delivering on its on its objectives and and everyone having a great time so i think there tends to be some highs and lows because you spend time with people doing good like that and you're out there for, for five days and we, we call it the bubble. You kind of go into this artificial world where you're just surrounded by good. And then when you come to the end of tour, the bubble, the bubble bursts and then you go back to reality. And, you know, my reality is, is pretty amazing, but there are the, you know, you do feel as though you can suddenly come down from a, from a slightly artificial high. And those highs are less and less from doing as many tours as we do now. It's not just once a year. Um, but I'm, I, would, I wouldn't change it for the world. And I think the impact that it has on the family and being healthy and positive and, you know, I have got that balance of being able to get home when I need to and get to this kids' school things when they're on and, you know, I can pretty much dictate when I work, but there's no shortage of, of hours being put in just because I love what we're, what we're building. Yeah, no, look, it's... Uh... 
It, it sounds sounds fantastic. And you know, how can people? We've talked a lot about uh, Tour to Cure. How can someone listening to this podcast today, uh, um, Build Live Give community listeners, how can they help uh, Tour to Cure? Uh, Paul, look, love where we've always said that you know the quality of the people that get involved is is our magic. So. You know, if there's good people out there that want to help and if they are keen to, to volunteer, come and ride on our tours, get behind us, bring your, get your organisation to come and get involved. You know, it's, I think we've got opportunities around the country and, and on each of the events and, and certainly new opportunities. You know, we're open to ideas on how we can kind of have uh, a connection um, a lot wider and, and broader than we currently have. So we've got big ambitions and love to welcome good people that want to help. You know, I can't do, we can't do it alone and cancer won't cure itself. So uh, cancer's, cancer's our cause and finding an end to, to it is, is something I want to achieve in my lifetime and much sooner. In fact, I'd like to think that uh, in, within the next 10 years, we'll be there and that way I can kind of choose to do something different for the next 10 years. Yeah, great. And um, there'll be links to this in the show notes, but uh, tour to cure dot com dot au is where someone can go and find out more and uh you know hopefully one day we can um solve cancer that well that um we can then get you uh, pointed towards kidneys which is uh something <laughs> very close to my uh well heart but uh, <laughs> yeah we, we can uh take the model and, and apply it there so um the next round is is the final round and it's just really getting into some practical um information to help our Build, Live, Give listeners actually take some action out of this. And, you know, you've left some great inspiration here. And I personally want to go out and, um, you know, do more for your cause, but also um, do more for mine. And I'm sure other listeners are feeling the same. But this one's a little more practical. And uh, I'll just ask you a series of questions, just some quick answers. So uh, the first is, you know, what's your number one productivity tip uh, that you'd love to give uh, BLG listeners? Oh, man, I'm a, I'm a big one on lists. You know, if it's not written down, you probably won't get it done. <clears throat> you know, so I've got um, a section of my notebook that I just start writing down things and as, as easily as I can abbreviate them so I can know exactly what I need to do without drawing out each of the actions underneath it. But certainly having lists and, and knowing who to talk to and get people to help. You know, you can't do it all. And I think reach out, you know, you'd be surprised with the generosity of people. Fantastic. And look, I know you you spend a lot of time on the bike, but you know, your mobile phone is, is something that we can't do without. What, what are a couple of key apps on your mobile phone that uh, you couldn't live without? <laughs> That's pretty interesting, actually. I was having to think about that one. Um, weather zone. <laughs> Got to know the weather. Uh, yes. My game, what I'm doing. Uh, there's one called Strava, which is a bit of a, a social platform for the cyclists that measures where you've ridden and and what you've actually done on the ride um what else have i got here you know flippergrams and some of those other ones twitter and all the social media ones man i'm not a big app guy i must i probably should be i think i don't really really recognize the the time saving that i can achieve through them but you know your digital device now all your banking and you know your ubers and all those sorts of things they sit you know a, a touch finger away yeah, yeah, no, where the service economy, it's a, it's a brilliant place. What about uh, podcasts? Do you have any uh, favourite podcasts that you listen to? I don't. Again, I'm, I'm, I just don't. It's not from lack of um, interest in it. I just, I think now I don't get that much listening time and maybe that's where I'm a, I, I learned early on I'm a very visual person and to my wife's, you know, detriment, I, the world I see is kind of what I'm influenced by. So I'm not as big um, in the audio space, but, you know, to watch the show, um, I'll, I'll pull it apart and see it in my own world, whereas I've not never really been one to get um, get into the audio space. And I think even now that I've, I'm less than 500 metres from the office, sorry, it's about 700 metres, you know, I can't even put something on for the drive home thinking I could catch up on stuff. So I just don't have that time. Great. Well, hopefully um, you'll listen to one, at least <laughs> one in the future, which is the BLG I missed my podcast. cue there, didn't I? BLG <laughs> That's my only one. 
that's it. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll chip away at that one. And, uh, you know, what's um, one piece of advice you'd love to leave people on either starting their own business or as you have started a brilliant uh, not-for-profit or, or uh, cause-related uh, business? I can't remember who said it to me, but um, you know, years ago, and I think it might have been last I was traveling, the, I had a choice of going to two different places and I kind of, the, you know, you're torn between a waterfall and, a, and an adventure of some sort. And someone made the comment here, is, what are you going to regret more? You know, are you going to regret going to the waterfall? You're going to regret not doing the adventure. And I think I've always tried to have that in my psyche around the choices that you make and, and you know, creating something. What are you going to regret more? You're going to regret not creating it or you're going to regret creating it and, and it taking longer than you thought to achieve it or, you know, not getting, you know, whatever the, the path to get there, but what will you regret more? Excellent. Look, that's uh, great advice. And uh, as we said, people can find out more at tourdecure.com.au. That'll be in the show notes. And I'd love to thank you, Jeff, for sharing your wonderful journey to the BLG listeners. And we wish you every success in the future. Thanks, Paul. Look forward to, uh, look forward to catching up on the bike one day soon, mate. Long overdue. Yes, very true. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you for listening to the Build Live Give Show. If you found this show helpful, please share it with others so we can build businesses, live great lives, and give back to the community. If you would like to join the BLG community, go to our website, www.buildlivegive.com. Until next time, thanks for listening.